I want to start out with this video saying that I worked for this company for six years. And in six years, I saw a lot of growth and improvements in this box. And there's a lot of stuff that I helped improve with the box. So, stuff that I found out improved the longevity of the boxes to keep them going and as well as the company itself. Because I'm not really sure how well that would have been had they not had somebody there catching all the issues that they found. So, let's start with the outside. This is the faceplate. A lot of time damages occur when you don't have a reaction when you clear the screen. But people would stab that with the screwdriver which would damage the keypad underneath which would then lock up your box. There were three different designs of this faceplate that made it to production. There was the, there's two of them that were shiny. One had no tactile function. The other one had a tactile function where you can hear it. And then you have this one that had the, they're kind of embossed so it makes it look like it was supposed to be this way. The first two were not UV rated. And I believe this one is UV rated, so it's going to be in the sun. The first two, um, you'll see the, the face plate will be cracked and it'll be just literally destroyed. So that's all I have to say about that. The door screws here, they had stainless screws for a long time. And stainless and aluminum, this box is made out of aluminum have a chemical reaction. So they will chemically bind with each other inside. There are a lot of people who actually would try to take the screw out and end up busting the heads off. And then you'd have these studs and screws sitting here. Inside there is three main boards here that you see. This is the DC version. They have an AC version. And they also have what the AC version is, it has the power supply, so you can have 120 to 240 ran to the power supply, which you apply voltage here, and it comes out to there, runs down below, 24 volts comes out of here. You have two different versions with a DC. You have what you see here, and you have one with a, a DC board. Now, with the DC board, You'll see that they had a little L shape with that box. That L shape was something I designed and came up with because they were having a hard issue with trying to get wiring down below because the DC board and the AC board were not designed the same way. Um, so I came up with that. It was an actual piece of a board that I made with a um, junction box board if I remember correctly back when it was Sock Valley Systems. It wasn't even it wasn't even Beltway at this point. So I took that and I cut it L shaped to here and put a standoff on it and went around and everybody liked it. There was other versions where they had a purple connector and we shoved it in and that worked for the most part but they didn't they wanted more of a a fitted look. They wanted to make it an afterthought. Which they never did change the color of the board. You should see this board here is it's blue in color. And that usually signifies that this is the CE boards. And the green boards that you have are the, the non CE boards. They are the Rev 2 edition. These are, are the Rev 4s and that's what the the only difference between Rev 2 and Rev 4, component-wise, there's some differences, but the main differences between Rev 2 and Rev 4 is that they uh, disconnected, basically, chassis ground and digital ground, so they're not having all this noise going to your IC chips. <laughs> so, I mean, going through the CE testing, that's where they were able to come out with and be ahead in. Had a lot of failures with the 10 ohm capacitors. There's about 3,000 boxes made that we had. 
that these were yellow and they are underrated so if you have the yellow ones that are not in the blue board their chances are you're gonna have um, a fire happening so you need to take and get those changed out this coil here you see how it's loose it's wiggled because the the pins the leg of this coil is actually underneath there so it raises it up the vibration of your machine causes this to eventually will break off and when that breaks off your buck boost sucker here will fly out and you don't want that and it will actually bind to the board and it will be a pain in the butt to change i know this because i had to do all the repairs um that's why i'm telling you this now so I, this all this information i'm going to tell you is preventative maintenance to make your box last longer in the long run okay put some hot glue put some silicone in between here bind these two guys here together with that goop and this won't ever fall off and you won't have any problems here majority of the time the non-CE boards, the green boards, sometimes, or a lot of times, just train, this MOSFET here would just catch fire for no apparent reason. And then they changed that and it made it a lot better. It still had some issues, but it was drastically less. They had three different versions of this ribbon cable. The original version had a three inch cable. I think it was like four and a half, but I called it a three inch cable. And then I have the six inch cable that with it sat like this and then it folded over like that when the door was closed. And then you have this version when the door closed, it folds flat against itself. There's a reason behind this is when you have it facing this way, it folded against itself and it caused tension right here, which would break the connections here which causes um, this IC chip here which is your ethernet chip here and once it fries it will have a white screen in your box pretty much unless you're, you have a newer one it'll just be white screen and it won't work so I came and I looked and found you know, NASA even had that recommendation that you would do your ribbon cable just like this. So you don't have failure. I had to fight with that one. But this ribbon cable here itself reduced the amount of failures they had by far, hardwood wise, probably by 70%. Without, there's no BS in that, okay? So... If you have the first two mentioned, take and get a different cable, a ribbon cable. And they either supply them at the, the business, I think, I don't know, they've changed hands again. So since I've worked for them, I know nothing about the new company. Um, this box I actually got off of eBay. So I've been looking on eBay for the last two years to find a box. I like this box here. This is six years of memories and struggles and uh, blood, sweat, and tears, basically. So I had to have it. I paid a pretty good amount of money to get it, but you can still get some on eBay. There's one right now that's listed for $800. So it kind of gives you the ballpark of what I paid for this. Raven Cable. Let's keep moving on. Green boards had surface mount capacitors. They were the teeny tiny ones. And they, uh, sometimes they would blow, sometimes they wouldn't. If you're, this fuse here, that the surface mount was blown, chances are this MyFet is shorted. Okay, so you'll find out soon enough that that might be the case. If you're wetting on your equipment, and you don't disconnect your box from it they would have a resistor here and or your earth ground trays will be blown off as well we always had that one resistor that fried happened a lot with lightning too and they have this problem sometimes here with these two resistors as well they never really fixed that problem but 
it is what it is. So, these capacitors will catch on fire if they're not the right kind. Um, you have some fire damage over here. This guy's capacitor in this coil is the backlight circuit that feeds into the integrated board. There's a diode over here, D17 and Q1, Q2 that feeds into the backlight circuit. Your input voltage matters. You need to have a good clean 12 volts or a good clean 24 volt because the input of this feeds into here and this powers the backlight circuit of the TFT screen and the I.O. board that you would have down below. The sensor board and the rest of the circuitry is not attached to the backlight is powered directly from your input voltages. They do have their own buck boost circuits, so it kind of helps, but it doesn't go through here first. We're gonna take this board off a little bit more to talk about some of the other issues, and then we'll move on to the integrated board. Okay, once you remove your five screws, you'll be able to take and move your terminal board up so you can see it. Uh, this chip here powers the PoE. If you don't have any voltages here, it's because you're missing a fuse. There are these capacitors down below inside here. Sometimes the legs were not soldered on and it affected your output for this side. If we flip it on the back side, green and blue boards both had this, these two parts here, U3 and D5. Um... If they were shorted out, they would cause a white screen, and you basically could just take and break them off, and that would fix your issue. Uh, I'm not thinking there was anything else much to discuss about this board. It really didn't have much other than random failures with this. Mainly for preventive maintenance, you need to take and glue this, and make sure your capacitors are the right value. But I wanted to point this out here before we moved on to that. This is the Ethernet jack. I've found too many USB into this. This is not a USB jack. If you shove a USB in here, you're going to short something out. And you're going to cause a white screen on this. This is a USB jack up here. They made the USB keep out here mainly just for the bottom one because it had no electrical connection. His top one, which one's supposed to be for the USB. Let's talk about the integrated board next. This is your integrated board. So, remove your four screws and you can get to this cable here. And that's for your faceplate. This would probably likely be zip tied to this, so you have to remove it like that. Add a little clip on it. This battery here keeps your date in check. So if your date by now is is screwy, change your battery out. This is a 2032 SCR 2032. You'll notice that this has both of the USB blocked. Typically, they would just have one open for USB. There's some firmware that they had um, having the USBs in this, in there will cause it to lock up overnight. So you, you wanted to make sure the customers didn't have the USB accessible. Um, so this is the buck beef circuits for the rest of those chips here. I did talk about this Ethernet chip here a little bit about it. But it's fry out just by that ribbon cable having an issue some software that they have that you can bypass that and with the later ones like this one this can go could go bad and you can still operate the the box itself one thing i did want to point out um in electronics, you do have some rules and regulations, just like you would for electrical. This ribbon cable here carries the communication for the Ethernet Pi chip, okay? And you're supposed to be one inch away from 
the magnet, the, there's magnets inside there. So magnetic, you have to be one inch away from this and no further than two inches. So the tip sits over here and you have six inches of cable. You're about eight inches away and that's too far. And this can just randomly go. Um, not a major issue, but poor design. It needed to be fixed, and they wouldn't fix it. You will wonder what this might be. They call it a uh, wire mod, and this is done by a board vendor. I actually had a different wire mod. It blended into the circuit board itself, and you couldn't tell. It didn't have a hot glue on here. This coil here and this capacitor, you want to make sure that you take and glue that down. They break off as well. Let's move on to this screen. If you could take and wiggle your screen, take this clip here and push it this way enough that you can take and pull out one side and do the same for the other and pull it out. Go get you some double-sided tape and put down here. Double-sided foam tape would work just fine as long as it's not too thick. The holder itself is made to fit the older screen that they had, they changed board the screen manufacturers. So this screen here was spec differently for the plastic holder, and that we had to tape that down. Did have a lot of failures at first because they wanted this ribbon cable here off the board, and that would rub against the front of this here, and it would short out, which would cause. Uh, Q1, Q2, and D17 to short out. So I came up with the idea about the poly I made, taping it down and keeping that flush. If you don't have this tape, hopefully by now it don't have any damage, you possibly have. Um, it will cause damage here. And you can see if you press down on there, the screen will blink on and off if that's an issue. Sometimes you could get away with in production that the clips here wouldn't be pressed down and this just kind of got backed out and you can just press down on this clip. You can't buy this screen anywhere. They either proprietary to the company, so and it's only because of the circuitry that they made. If you really wanted to get into it, you can buy a second screen, but you have to have a different board and you have to know all the logic and all that, and it's not really worth it. There are some other issues that I don't really care to talk about, and, and I'm not going to get into that because it really doesn't affect the end users too much other than software. Let's move on to sensor board. I'm not trying to make this a very long video so i'm gonna cut this while it takes the screws out the sensor board has five screws and then you can just lift it straight up your main issues with the sensor board occasionally you'll have problems with this fuse being out of the fuse clip they made the hole too wide for the fuse holder itself and sometimes they get kind of cocked and you can just take and just press that down and mirror the fuse clip so it makes it nice and straight. It's the same way that's on the terminal board. They were told about it, but they just choose not to take and change it. If you have problems with your low cell voltages not being 5 volts, this guy right here, R127. It is a R100 value, so I think it's like 0.1 resistance or 0.1 ohms. Occasionally you might have this fuse here not being soldered on one side and it would cause intermittent problems with your speed sensor. These here are switching gates for your low cells. Each one would have a pair and then they fit into one which fit into the um, A and D logic. If you're not getting any communications to your the rest of your box, if it says no com, chances are U40 and U20 is shot and they didn't need to be replaced. If you have lightning damage on your low cells and you probably will have problems with your resistors on the bottom here, 
R4, 5, 166, and 165 pertain to one low cell, and the next group, and the next group, and the next group pertain to each one. You'll see the tops of them are blown off. If one side here is blown off, that means the other ones are bad as well, so you might as well change all four of them at the same time. So, I just wanted to tell you that much. Not a whole lot of, a lot of failures that made it out to the field. Just randomly, they would have some in-house. Um, it happens. Never had an issue with this quill falling off with this capacitor. These two shift here, bringing the voltages to the rest of this board. They step down each one. We're going to move on to software side. And mainly talk about uh, white screens and different things that would affect it. I already discussed some of the stuff on here. I've discussed the Ethernet chip being an issue. Your ribbon cable will cause the white screen. The screen itself being an issue. Voltages being too low will cause an issue. And your USB itself can cause an issue if the USB is corrupt. If you have a USB that has their logo on it, those were used for promotional use only and not to be used for everyday use. They're not a good USB. Then they had the Axiom, they're just black and white, and they're also not a good USB. They had the other ones that are sand disc and they're red and black and they were okay. Didn't have a lot of problems with those. So if you have the two, get rid of the two and get, get, get a sand disc one. I'm going to power this up and show you some of the software and, and its features. If you're looking for calibration and software settings, this is not that video. This is the video that talked about parts that catches on fire and things that you need to do to change to make your bot last longer. Before I forget, these chips over here also have something to do with the communication with the sensor board. So if you don't have communication with the sensor board still after changing those two chips here you might want to take a look at getting this looked at as well being replaced now the older boxes when you powered them on had a white screen and it stayed white until the box was done loading up the usb newer ones they have what's called a bootloader and they have this splash screen If your box is unresponsive, a lot of times it's because the clear weight screen is uh, corrupt. Now, this issue here happens occasionally, and was I've reported that several times, and it doesn't have anything. It doesn't have a USB installed whatsoever. So what you're gonna have to do is take and you do another power reset, a power cycle for it to work and that's only with some of the software that's newer so back to what I was talking about if your box isn't working correctly and you can't get into screens here. It could be your clear weight button is messed up because they jammed it with a screwdriver, or you have settings in your clear weight here that is garbage, like it'll be NAN and all this other random gibberish. So you need to press this thing like 16 to 20 times for it to clear all the tonnage and stuff. Okay? And we're gonna hit the menu button. Let me see if I can take and focus in so it's not so much of a glare. There. That's kind of better, but not much. Hit the menu button, go down to totals and diagnostics. And you go to totals, and you will have NAN in here as well. This happens with old and new boxes, and you want to clear them out by doing this or hitting your clear button on each one. Master total on the new boxes, you can't clear it from this screen. You have to go to administration, uh, security, go down to the bottom, 
and go to factory reset and then you can clear your master total. Let's go back to total and diagnosis. Diagnosis has a good screen here. If you look at your voltages, you can see nine volts for your low cell and five volts. That's for your speed sensor and angle sensor. If that is zero volts there, that's likely because it's um, R127 on the sensor board or you have a short on your low cell itself. Um, go back to sensors. If you see, if you change this to a four, if it's a dual idler, and then you only use the two and you change it back to a single idler and you still have this. Just reboot the box. Sometimes that will clear it. And otherwise you have like 15 and all this stuff on here. It's, it's a known issue. And the default for the angle sensor is always 12. Sometimes you'll see no com to IO board. You want to make sure if you don't have an IO board. You tell it to be not installed. If it is, have an IO board installed, then you either have a problem with the integrator, we have a board here having a short, or the IO board itself having an issue. Sometimes the IO board itself would have a part placed on there and it's, it's not the right part. It should be one voltage and they use a different voltage part that it can get caught in production until later on. As far as the other settings and stuff, I'm not going to go through a lot of this stuff. I just wanted to do, touch the basics and talk about hardware that you need to change and some of the stuff here that you can learn how to do on your own. All these here need to be on when you're doing looking at stuff. And it doesn't really matter about the Modbus and SVI when if you're not using either that. The rest you want to have on. If you're having problems with your junction box, just make sure that this fuse here is pressed down all the way. That's another issue that I mentioned before. Now the newer boxes, they had a bootloader so you can press down down twice. And you can do a test on a keypad and make sure that the keypad is fully functional. That's something I wanted to have in here because they had a lot of people having problems with the keypad. And I thought that that would be something ideal for salespeople to take and troubleshoot over the phone instead of just saying, it's just sitting in because you want to be able to test all your functions out in the field. And hit the back button to get out all those. If I had a USB, all this stuff here would be lit up so you'd be able to see it. You can clone your, you can create a clone and you can send that in and they can create, they could put that clone onto another box and see what they're saying if you have issues and stuff like that. There'll be a symbol down here that says uh, this wire looks like a resistor color code. It's uh, blue in color. That means they had the wire mod, which we already discussed. And if it's white and blue, that means, or white and red, I don't remember. That means that it doesn't have the wire mod. If you have a green icon over here for your Ethernet, that means it's good, your Ethernet's working. If it's red, that means your Ethernet chip is bad, or the, USB, the uh, ribbon cable itself is bad, or something to do with the terminal board. Default for the Ethernet for the DHCP changed over time. Sometimes it's enabled, sometimes it's disabled. If your router is set up to change your stuff and you don't want it to change it, you have to make sure that's one way or the other. Then you can change your IP addresses. The older versions didn't have this nice screen here. It had a, just a, um, just a, a keyboard on the screen, basically, and you had to go on and maneuver it. It was a pain in the, in the rear to do that. It's a lot of improvements with the newer boxes that they did. So, yeah.
that's your basic troubleshooting i just wanted to go over hardware stuff versus software because if there's a whole nother chapter for software being an issue and i kind of wanted to keep this video semi short and you know you got the basics of running preventative maintenance for the future especially this ribbon cable here and the capacitors being an issue so you want to make sure to change those out so that they don't catch fire before we part ways i did want to talk about this this piece of paper here that you might see in the newer box it gets shoved in this envelope with your power over even that fuse that's in here um this piece of paper here means a lot for me at least Originally, in the first two years, when I was working there, everything was done by hand. You use a voltmeter and you measure, 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 measure. It was time consuming to get this done. A lot of human errors were made. So I came up with the concept of taking, I made an automated box, which is a lot larger. You can see these some of the videos that they have on their Facebook. And it's a very large white box and kind of angled as what we had in the shop. And I was able to take in look at all the load cells and stuff and they decided they wanted to shrink this box to what they have now and be able to take in print out a report that shows all the stuff that's been tested now that design was actually looked at before by another company and was a proposal of like ninety thousand dollars so i made them the first concept of it and it didn't cost $90,000. It cost less than $600, if that much, you know. But we improved in you know, time, quality, time, quality, and quantity. We were able to test boxes out in half a day versus the full day and maybe some the next day. Because uh, these boxes took so long to do, you know, the, the process that the end users you don't see. There's... A lot of screws in here, there's a lot of programming and flashing and calibration of the sensor board and loading software and, and all these little different pieces add up to time. You know, the, your stacks have to be put together and assembled and it's a whole process. So this here, I was uh, the one that initiated and got this ball rolling for that. So the quality and all that, you can thank again me for doing such a wonderful job. The ribbon cable, my deal. The old shape board, my deal. Uh, the new capacitors, because I had to literally catch them on fire, was my deal. So, you're welcome. <laughs> I hope this helped your video, your uh, scale box, and you as a company or a person out. I don't know if they sell parts anymore as far as ribbon cables. If they change hands, you can get this part, this ribbon cable off of DigiKey, and I can provide you the link for that if you need. It's not a big deal. It's not a big secret either. So, I think that's about it. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Please consider subscribing.